In this video, we're going to cover some of the utility nodes that uh, I prefer to use when rigging. Uh, I'm not going to show a whole lot here. I'm just going to talk about these uh, just to give you guys some guidance. Uh, I did one on the decompose matrix, and uh, I had some people wondering what were other good utility nodes uh, that I used. Um, and I use just to backtrack here a little bit, I use utility nodes as much as possible for doing any sort of math equation of matching, you know, say do this translate versus that translate or anything like that. Um, when I first started, I, I used to use expressions, um, but utility nodes are the better way to go when you can use them. Um, one, they compute whenever you're moving them versus uh, at playback. Uh, expressions often only play back, uh, you know, uh, calculate when you're playing through the timeline. So if you're just moving an object on screen, working on it on, you know, and staying on the same keyframe, they may not update uh, with an expression. Um, so it's going to be more predictable for your animator, but also these are typically faster to calculate than expressions also. So if you're rendering uh, or just looking for real-time playback, uh, these are often more efficient for that as well. Um, so you could find these uh, in window create node. That's how I get this one open. Uh, the other way I often do it is through the node editor and just right click and say create node. Um, and I'm just going to go and talk about some of these real quick and, and the ones that I commonly use. Uh, there are some other great ones in here and just it, for the stuff I do day to day, it doesn't come up so, so much. Um, that or I don't know what they are. Like I have no idea where is it. I have no idea what Compose Matrix does. I have tried to look this up and not really sure what that one is. Um, which does bring me to a point though, is you, you can look up most of these. It's, most of these are in the Maya help documentation. You can just Google search, you know, if you want to know about these color, uh, blend colors node, Maya, and you'll probably get the first result being the, the one that you want to explain what that does. Um, on that, let's start with that one actually, blend colors. Uh, so let's go ahead and make this real quick and you kind of see what you have here. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. This is made for shaders. So you can blend one color into another. It's an RGB value here. So here's your first RGB value. Here's your second RGB value and your blender. So zero is all color one. And if you were to set it up to one, that's all color two. Um, and why is that helpful? Well, because X, Y, Z can be put in place for RGB. So that could be a translate value. It could be a rotate value that I could plug in and say, uh, th th this is actually what I use a lot of the time for um, switching from FK to IK. So I have three rigs. I have my skinning skeleton that is following either the IK skeleton or the FK skeleton. Uh, so I'll have the rotations of my FK skeleton joint up here and my IK one down here, and I'll use this blender to sw swap back and forth between rotations. Um, so this one's good for three inputs. Um, say you only have one, you could use the blend to uh, attribute utility, which is basically this, but with just two inputs. Um, and you, you hook it up kind of the same way. And actually, let's let's go ahead and make something with this real quick. Uh, I think I just made one. So let's see. Oh, window popped up off over here. Okay. So let's go ahead and make, let's go ahead and make three cubes. Um, And as I'm thinking about it, this might actually work with more than two inputs, but I've never done more than two, uh, just because I haven't had a need. But maybe you do, so you know, it, these are great tools to play around and experiment with. So I've built three cubes, and what I'm going to do is take the translate Y of the bottom one and the top one and have it blend to the center one. Um, th this one I'll show you real quick, because it's, it's not quite as intuitive as the first one that I just explained. Um, because of how you connect things. So I'm going to take, oh, here I'm at my actual cubes. This is the shape nodes. So cube one, I'm going to take the translate Y and plug it into, is it just, is it only going to let me do other? Okay, I guess the first one has to be done through the connection editor. So let's go ahead and do that. Load these up through the connection editor. I already happen to have it open, so window, uh, general editors, connection editor, or yeah, connection editor. And let's go find translate Y. 
and input. Okay, so that creates input zero. So this is an array. As I keep adding these, this will just keep adding up. But you'll notice I'm not able to add it, another one in here, just input. If I, if I connected some other translate y to this, it would just replace input zero. So in that case, I'm going to go over here and take cube three, which is my top cube, take its translate y. I wonder why they do that. It doesn't seem like a great user experience. Uh, connect it to input one. And you can see now that I already have one thing hooked up, it'll allow me to do input one. Um, if I wanted to do, I'm not going to do this, but I'm just showing you. If I had input y from this one and connect it, you know, it's giving me input two. Um, but uh, I'm going to take the output of this and connect it to cube two instead. I hook it up to its translate line. We'll probably see it move. Oh, that was cube two. Well, whatever. That, that'll work fine. I'll just kind of pull this one up a little bit higher. Um, and I'm going to select my blend to attribute node. And here's my blender. And I can hook this up through a controller, which is probably what I'd end up doing. But I go to head, hold down control and middle mouse drag with this name selected. And you can see as I blend from zero to one, it switches from one to the other. Um, now, the unintuitive part was one that how you connect that up because it's an array. Um, you have to keep connecting through there. But two, uh, it multiplies. So as I go past one, it's going to keep, it's going to do 1.28 the value of y and keep going past that. So that can be handy sometimes. Like uh, maybe for if you're hooking up blend shapes, you know, that might be what you want to blend between two different blend shapes or two different controls. Um, so that's blend two attribute. Um, what's another one I use? Uh, I've used clamp before, uh, and clamp will allow you to take an RGB value, but again, it could be an XYZ value, and limit it. And so, say you have a control that you know goes above zero to one, just like we did, but you really need this to read between zero to one because you're, you're turning something binary on and off, or it's a color-related thing. Um, you could say, hey, once we go past one, don't don't go any farther than that. You could go to zero to one, and that's fine. You, your input could be bigger or smaller than that, and you know if it's anywhere in between, it'll you'll see those numbers slide. Uh, but the output will not go any bigger than one, any smaller than one, or whatever number you actually need. Uh, occasionally, that's useful. I, I think I use this more when I'm doing particle effects, um, but there's potential for that to be useful for a rig, depending on what you're driving. Um, uh, condition node. Uh, this is one I use in pretty much every character rig. Um, and basically what this says is, here's your first term and here's your second term. If it's true, be this value. If it's false, be this value. Um, where I will often use that, let's go ahead. I lied. I'm going to show you guys some of this stuff. Um, oops, I'm going to just make one joint here duplicate that over. Uh, and I'll go ahead and create a cube real quick. Um, and I'm showing you guys this because this is how I deal with uh, foot rolling. So let's say I've made a foot. I'm just going to eyeball this. And here it is on the ground. Here's one edge of the foot. And here's the other end. Um, I'm going to go ahead and parent those two joints together. Um, and we'll parent this cube under the child joint. So basically I want something that says, hey, if, if my main foot control rotates negative, roll the foot this way. And then until you get back to zero, and then once you, you rotate positive, rotate the foot that way. And that way I get something that looks like it's rolling across the edge of the foot. Um, so what I'll do is I'll make two condition nodes and I'll say, uh, I'll just make another one here again because I don't know where my first one went. Um, first term. Uh, oh, let's go ahead and look at this in the attribute editor. And I could say, okay, so if my first term and second term, usually what I'll do is I'll hook in, um, say, my controller up to the first term and leave the second term blank. And I'll say, hey, if this is greater than zero, take those rotations and bump it out. If not, leave it at zero. You're not rotating. And then I'll make the second one and do the opposite and say, hey, uh, if this is if it's now rotating the other way and we're going to negative numbers instead of positive, I can't remember which way I said first, um, 
now pump in those numbers for the true statement and have this one rotate. And if it's going the opposite direction, where we go, I can't remember which way is which. Let's say this side's negative, this side's positive. So if we're rotating negative, this guy rotates. If we're rotating positive, this guy rotates. Uh, if we're going negative, this one stays zero. If we're going positive this way, this guy stays zero. Um, so I could do that with two nodes and, and get that going. And if, you, if you're wondering about that, go look up one of my videos on how to set up a reverse foot roll rig. And uh, I believe we do that in that video. Um, but condition nodes are great. So it, it's basically saying, hey, only when these conditions are met. You know, you could say only when these values are equal, only when they're greater than or equal, um, only when they're not equal. So you have some options in there. Um, curve info node. Uh, I, I use this one a lot on stretchy rigs, but I don't ever actually make it here. Um, so I could click on it and where did that just go? And in theory, I could hook that up to a curve. And actually, you know, I've never actually hooked one of these up. Um, so I always use these on curves. So if I go ahead and create a curve real quick, and I want to know how long it is, that's what this guy will tell me. Except I never actually do this and hook it up because I could make one really simply with a uh, mel script by typing in arc len dash ch, which stands for construction history. That's a Boolean operation, so I type in one with that curve selected, and I hit enter, and now it has one, and I don't have to hook it up. Actually, let's go ahead and see how easy or hard that would be to hook up. Uh, let's see. Let's select curve info node. Let's graph it. What is going in? So it's just the world space of that curve going into the, the input curve. So that should be pretty easy to make. Let's, let's try it real quick. I've never actually done this. So what did that say? World space zero and two, sure, other. We'll just open up uh, input curve. And are we getting the same values? Yeah, OK, those are the same. So that's all you have to do for that. So it was world space zero that you're hooking up into that input uh, input curve. So, but you can see right here that's giving you that length of that curve. So if I change the length of this curve, so it says 20.945 right now. Oh yeah, 29. Sorry, it was 20 before that. The nine moved to decimal point, which threw me off. Yeah, there we go. We can see we're changing the length. And you can use that to then say, use a different utility node, which we'll get into in a minute, the multiply divide node, and say, hey, take the current length divided by the original length to give me you know, a scale value that I can then scale the joints by to make them stretch appropriately to keep their length equivalent to the length of this curve. So that's what that's really useful for. Um, decompose matrix is the thing that started this all. I could plug in the world transform matrix of an object into this, and it'll spit out a local translation. So if something was a parent object, so, so like actually here's you know a good example of this cube is a child of these two joints. And maybe I want to know how much this is rotated, but if I go look at it because it's a child and it's uh, relative to its parent, there's no rotation value on it right now. But if I go and hook it up to this, uh, open up my connection editor, uh, decompose matrix, um, where is it? I need the world matrix of this, and I'm sure it's right in front of me. You guys are screaming at me. There it is. Uh, and take the world matrix, connect it to the input matrix. I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this cube. Let's unparent it and zero it out. You can have it. Oh, I'm going to leave the scale so it's the same size. Let's move it up here. And if now I take the output uh, rotation, there it is, and hook it up to this new cube I just made, you can see they're rotated the same. And whenever I rotate 
of its parent. It stays rotated the same relative to that cube. So that's what that thing's great for. Um, let's see, what else do I use in here? Um, I'm trying to remember what I use for, uh, I do dynamics effects and particle effects sometimes, and some of these are really useful for those, but not so great for regular rigging stuff. Uh, maybe that's another video, but I'm also really rusty on my particle effects stuff. Uh, multiply divide. Multiply divide is a really useful node. Um, it does basically what you think it does. It either multiplies or divides. Uh, open up here in the attribute editor. And so if you have it set to multiply, uh, input one by input two. So this is good for XYZ values. You could hook up a single channel, X, Y, or Z if you want, or all three, uh, and multiply them together. You can divide them together, or you could do power of together. Power, I don't think I've ever actually used. I usually use multiply for most things because I could do, you know, multiply times 0 0.05. Um, although I could do it by divide usually. Uh, well, not usually. I, I could use divide. I uh, need to divide something by another number. But um, I think the only time I ever use this is for squash and stretch scale stuff. Um, but that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, what else are we using here? So plus minus average is kind of the same thing. Now this hooks up very similar to how that uh, blend to uh, attributes node did where you have the array that you hook in because you could add as many things as you want, subtract as many things as you want, or average as many things as you want. Um, so right here you could see, do you want sum, subtract, or average? Uh, so it has a few different types. So if it's a single channel, like if you just want X, you'd hook it up to input 1D. Uh, if it's two channels, like a UV coordinate, you'd hook it up to input 2D. And then input 3D would be like full on translate, full rotate, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and they hook up the same way, where if I, I'm guessing if I were to drag this over right now, say translate, there's not gonna be anything there yet. Oh, no, there is, okay, so input zero. So that would just keep adding in that way and just the more of those you have, the more it's adding in this particular case. Uh, if we wanted single channel, so I'm only doing say translate X, it'd be an input 1D. So uh, pretty basic, straightforward. Uh, okay, so what else do we have in here that I actually use? Um, reverse is one that I use every once in a while. Um, it, it really works better for images though. Uh, this will take you basically a one to zero and reverse it kind of thing. Um, it's not gonna give you negative numbers, um, but if you have a binary operation you need to flip, a reverse can work for that. Um, and what else do we have in here? Um, yeah, there's some others in here that I use, but again, that's more shader stuff or utility node stuff. So that, that kind of covers the basics of rigging. Um, actually, you know what, there is one other I have used a few times, set range. Um, and I am trying to remember how exactly this works. Uh, I know I've used it before and I'm trying to remember if this was particle effects or not. I think this is sort of like a clamp of how far in a value can go. Yeah, let's, let's ignore that. Um, anyway. If you're curious about any of these others, you can look them up. Uh, like I said, the, the Maya help documentation is pretty great for that. Um, and and see if these do anything useful for you. Sometimes just reading over what these do uh, can be very helpful. Uh, later on, you'll just know that that's a tool available to you. Um, a, a lot of these are just actual shader stuff though. So, you know, don't, don't sweat it if half of them aren't useful to you or anything like that. It's, you know, right tool for the right case. Um, anyway, that's, those are the utility nodes I use the most. So hopefully some of that's new information to you, some, some of that's helpful. Uh, and, uh, if you've got other utility nodes that are really helpful to you, uh, mention them down in the comic, uh, comments and how you use them. It'd be great to know some, some new ones and how people are using those themselves. All right. Uh, I hope that this was informative and I'll see you next lesson.